first question that people have been asking, they're wondering if there is an increased risk of getting COVID-19 if they're currently in treatment for breast cancer or living with metastatic breast cancer. Well, it's so early in the disease that we don't have as much information as we'd like to have uh, to answer that kind of a question. Um, I will define COVID-19 just so we are always on the same page. Uh, COVID-19 is the disease that's caused by an infection uh, by the coronavirus, which is the new strain that we are dealing with now. So many uh, people probably are infected by the coronavirus, but have not developed any signs or symptoms of the respiratory disease known as, a, as COVID-19. So I think among our patients, certainly some will be carriers of the coronavirus and will never get sick, just like, just like many people here, especially in New York. What we, what we don't, and our patients would not be at any increased risk to, uh, to become uh, uh, colonized with the uh, uh, coronavirus. Are they gonna get sicker than other people and become among the very sick patients that we see with this disease? We, at this time, we don't have evidence of that. We are concerned for our patients who are under having chemotherapy. It does cause a decrease in their white cell count. And it, uh, we give some medicines that go along with the chemotherapy, such as types of cortisone that can suppress the immune system. So we, we are concerned, but at the present time, we're not seeing a, a rash of the disease in our patients uh, uh, with, with breast cancer receiving treatment. Okay. And what about those who have been treated for breast cancer in the past, maybe in the past five years or 10 years or even more? Is there an increased risk of, of getting uh, COVID-19 in those circumstances? Well, again, we, we have had a lot of those calls, as I'm sure you have had at SHARE, uh, ranging from the question, I had breast cancer 20 years ago and I had uh, all my lymph nodes removed on my left side. Does that make my immune system more likely uh, to, to uh, be uh, attacked by the coronavirus? And the answer is no. We have plenty of lymph nodes uh, all over the body that the removal of what used to be done, 20 lymph nodes or so, uh, makes no effect on the immune system of the body. And within the last five years, a number of patients are calling saying, I had chemotherapy, I finished a year ago with more, the standard treatments that we use today. Am I more at risk? Again, it's very early in the, in the epidemic, but we are not seeing our patients coming in with severe respiratory illness uh, of COVID-19. And we really don't expect it. We are not seeing those patients getting other illnesses uh, that might uh, be seen in immunosuppressed patients. They're not getting rare forms of tuberculosis. They're not going getting rare infections. They're pretty much leading a normal life so we don't expect that we will see any increased risk in patients treated in the past uh, for breast cancer. Okay. And what about what com comorbidities might put people at a higher risk for getting COVID-19? The comorbidities are those that are not so uncommon in our uh, population. Number one, age. The average woman who gets breast cancer is probably around 53, 54, 55. But there are many over 60, over 70, over 80, and we have 90-year-olds, certainly in our survivorship clinic, who come every year for their checkups. So age is probably the major risk factor for getting COVID-19 as a result of uh, infection with the coronavirus. Other diseases, such as diabetes, uh, such as diseases that require patients to take drugs that suppress their immune systems. These are patients who've had kidney transplant, patients with severe forms of diseases such as lupus, uh, and those patients are, uh, will be at increased risk for the disease. So, you know, one question that we keep getting very often is, should we or should we not be wearing masks when grocery shopping, for example, or when we go to treatment at the hospital or clinic? I think we have, we have established now at the New York Presbyterian Hospital, which is a huge conglomerate of hospitals, Columbia, Cornell, and our hospitals, Brooklyn, Queens, Lower Manhattan, that all, all people coming into the hospital now will be required to wear masks. 
Now, there are two reasons for that. People coming into the hospital, um, many of them will be, will be coming to the hospital because they have a severe respiratory illness. Mm -hmm. and the masks should decrease the risk of spreading the virus. Uh, and number two, to protect our healthcare providers, we think that there's some protection to wearing a mask. It's not so clear that with the standard surgical mask, which is what we're wearing, that there is much protection. The third reason to wear a mask is really probably the best reason, and that is it, it, it keeps you away from putting your hands to your face. The best way to prevent the coronavirus from infecting you is to wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. And don't put your hands to your face because the virus comes in via the nose and the mouth. And uh, if you put your hands to your face after you have just uh, touched uh, uh, the, the, the bananas to see if they're ripe and 10 or 15 other people have just touched them also and then you put your hand to your face that's what we worry about so the mask keeps you away from your face so I think it is certainly a, a, a reasonable reason to wear a mask uh, today when you go out to the grocery store I don't think uh, it, it may not give you much protection from the virus that's staying six six feet away from the person ahead of you in the, in the line mm -hmm. and uh, uh, try and if you ha have to hand your credit card to the uh, lady at the at the counter to wipe it off uh, quickly when she gives it back to you good tips and it is true right we all touch our face even without knowing it right unconsciously we do it all the time without i'm very hard not to do it right now <laughs> That's right. That's right. If you walked around your house with a mask on, that's, you know, people might think that's doesn't make <laughs> sense, but if it keeps you away from your face, it's true. It's probably not a yeah. So patients are reporting to us that their treatment or their surgery has been postponed and they're anxious and concerned about their cancer advancing or progressing. Can you explain why this may be the best option for some patients? This has been a very hard discussion among the oncology community, the surgeons, the medical oncologists, the radiation oncologists. And not we thought we were way ahead of the game at Cornell by meeting on this immediately when we first uh, started having the early cases. Mm -hmm. But across the country, our colleagues are having the same discussions. And we have guidelines from a number of our major organizations, including guidelines from the American Society of Breast Surgeons. Uh, and the guidelines are we're, we're, we, are no, we are not screening patients for breast cancer during this epidemic. We're not doing routine mammograms and sonograms. And number one, we don't want to expose personnel to someone who might have the COVID-19. We don't want to uh, expose the, 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 the uh, woman who's coming for the mammogram in case there is other patients, are other patients that have it. Um, but also we, we have closed the operating rooms to be able to use them for the COVID-19. So to find a new breast cancer and not be able to deal with it at a time when the breast cancer is so small that waiting a few weeks or months will not make a difference is very reasonable. So we have stopped screening uh, for, for uh, breast cancer. The women who were screened at the end of February and have small breast cancers, most of them have had biopsies now, core biopsies, that made the diagnosis of breast cancer. And those women, we are postponing their surgery until after the epidemic is over. And this is being done routinely at all the medical centers and hospitals across the country. Um, and the, all the evidence that we have is that this will not be harmful to them in the long run. Many of them are, will be estrogen receptor positive as the majority of breast cancers are. And many of the women are being advised to start with tamoxifen or an aromatase inhibitor such as anastrozole while we wait for the surgery to, to happen. And this worries our patients a lot, but we have lots of evidence from past studies that it is a safe thing to do in, this, in, these, in these patients who are the majority of patients that we are delaying treatment. Now, some are metastatic patients who have no evidence of active disease but continue to have treatment or being advised to skip treatment. 
And of course, you know, this causes a great deal of anxiety and their concern that their disease may progress. What is your recommendation to these patients? Uh, it's really been case by case, and we meet each week and discuss those cases and look at them and see what's been the, the, the nature of their cancer. But many of those uh, women can stop treatments or the treatments can be given further apart. Mm -hmm. This keeps the patient out of the infusion room for their sake at a time when the, when the infection rate is so high. And it keeps the staff protected from patients who have, don't have any symptoms and then two or three days later are coughing and found to have a COVID-19. So it is case by case. It's not across the board, but in this, in, and each case is really considered in great depth. So we've been hearing in the news about the mention of drugs that are indicated for other diseases being used in the treatment of COVID-19. Do you have any information about these drugs? These are big questions for us. The major drug that's being thought about is a hydro, uh, uh, the hydroquinolone, which is called Plaquenil, is the hydrochloroquine, uh, Plaquenil. And um, it, there is some evidence that it may decrease the symptoms and the progression of COVID-19. It still it will be in clinical trial. It is available now for patients with COVID-19 symptoms, and there's plenty of it thanks to the uh, cooperation uh, of, the, of the pharmaceutical industry and all the uh, government workers, uh, that there, there seems to be enough that is needed. So it is used in the management of these patients at this time. Is it highly effective? It's too early to say. And so my, my last question for now, I, I hope that we're gonna be doing a webinar in the near future to sort of expand on uh, some additional questions and some other concerns about COVID-19 and cancer with, with yourself and maybe a couple of your colleagues. But the last question for now, uh, our metastatic patients often rely on clinical trials as potential treatment options or for the possibility of future treatments. Are all clinical trials suspended at this time? Uh, that's a very good answer and a great concern to our patients who are on clinical trials. At the present time, enrolling patients in new clinical trials is suspended. Mm -hmm. it, it takes an enormous amount of manpower uh, to enroll patients to get all the testing done before the drug is given. Um, so we are not enrolling new patients in clinical trials. Uh, however, if a patient is on a clinical trial and is doing well, these patients are continuing on the trial and receiving the medicine. They are uh, the, the patients who are on, on oral drugs and usually come in every two weeks, every three weeks to get their medicine. In our hospital, they're receiving the drugs by mail at home. And then they have a video conference, such as you and I are having, mm -hmm. uh, to discuss uh, the symptoms and so forth. And the patients take the medicine at home. For the intravenous clinical trial patients, uh, they are coming into the hospital and they are getting the clinical trial drugs. That's good to know. So thank you, Dr. Moore. We really appreciate your time. We hope to see you again in a couple of weeks with a colleague or two. To do, we'll have more questions for you at that point, but we appreciate your time. Thank you again. You've been such a great friend to us at SHARE and to all of the women that we serve. Thank you. Well, so thank, thank you, you for so continuing much. to serve them through this time. We need you more than ever. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you.